I suggest uh, we continue with the next talk, which Great, will be thanks. by Petros Papapanagotou on encoding object level um, reasoning with logics encoded in whole light. Um, Claudio, ah, you already did. Great. Um, Hi, then, thank you. Yeah, then I will pass on to you, Petros. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction and for managing to pronounce my surname so well. Oh, that was a guess, but thank you. <laughs> that was very good. Thank you. It's always a challenge for us. Uh, anyway, thanks very much. Can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, we can. All right, thanks. Uh, great. So this is um, this talk is about doing object level proofs with uh, custom logics that we've encoded in the theorem proof of all light. Uh, and I thought I'd start by motivating how this work uh, came to be. Uh, so this is part of a, a much larger project that uh, has to do with process management and workflow management, so improving how people work and how businesses operate and so on. Um, and, and this is the, the simple kind of methodology that we follow. Um, first, we introduce a, a diagrammatic kind of workflow of the operations in, in, in some organization. We have a lot of applications in healthcare and manufacturing, for instance. Uh, then this gets converted into executable code uh, so that it can be deployed and managed in a live system. Uh, and there it, it gets joined with uh, live tracking data. Uh, we use location sensors, for example, to track what's happening in the physical world uh, and try to map that, that into events uh, that are happening in the workflow so that we're able to manage what's, and monitor what's going on. Um, uh, so that gives us a nice little dashboard to be able to monitor the processes. We get timelines for each workflow that's running. We get analytics and insights, notifications, and so on. And finally, executing this workflow code in a different in a different setting. So with simulation, we can have some predictive analytics about uh, scheduling or decision support for optimization and that kind of things, getting a timeline into the future and various other uh, analytics. Uh, so this is quite a comprehensive kind of and long kind of process that gives us a lot of benefits. But I wanted to show that it's a very applied kind of approach and everything is driven from practice and application. Um, and for this particular talk, we're interested in the first two kind of uh, steps, where the idea, of course, is to have a formal representation of these workflows, a logic-based representation that allows us to get some code that is correct by construction and gives us some guarantees. The way we achieve this is through this uh, Carrie Howard style uh, correspondence between classical linear logic and concurrent processes in the Pi calculus, which is what we call the proofs as processes paradigm. Um, so essentially, linear logic proofs are converted into a specification of concurrent processes. Uh, and I don't want to go into too much detail, but here is a very simple high-level uh, exam healthcare example uh, about delivering a drug to a patient. Uh, this dashed edge here means uh, optional outcomes. Only one of the two can happen. But it's just two processes being put together. And the idea is that this composition is all um, controlled and, and done through this formal proof so that we get some uh, guarantees of linearity. We also get guarantees of deadlock freedom and so on. So essentially we're doing a proof where the two, the specifications of the two processes that we're using, that we're composing are assumptions. And with forward reasoning, we get the specification of this composite workflow. Uh, and then because of the correspondence, we are able to extract a Pi calculus term that translates this proof uh, exactly. The same way that you would extract a Lambda calculus term from Kari Howard and you have calls to these two processes that are the components over here. And of course, we'll take that Pi calculus term and convert it into Scala code so that it can be executed um, in the live system. Uh, so you can imagine that given this scenario and what I've showed you so far, we're very interested in doing this object level kind of proofs so that we can uh, create this uh, custom and, and composite specifications for processes. Um, and not only that, but the proof as processes paradigm has evolved a lot. Uh, in, the, in the recent years, there have been a lot of different um, similar uh, theories that translate linear logic to communicating processes. So starting from proof as processes in 94, Kairos and Penning picked up um, the, the theory in 20, around 2010 to attach session types to linear logic, starting with an intuitionistic uh, version. Um, and then later on also suggesting a classical, uh, uh, a translation of classical linear logic. Um, and there are quite a few variants of these, so the different changes in the session type and so on. Uh, in 2014, Wadler presented his paper on propositions as sessions, where he introduced his own session type calculus. 
uh, and attached it to classical linear logic. And even, even this year, there was a paper uh, about this unified linear logic uh, where they try to sort of marry both worlds of indigenistic and classical. Uh, well, I don't want to, to go too deep into these ideas, but I just want to show that even it's, it's a very live kind of topic right now, uh, this, uh, exploring these kind of theories. So again, from the practical perspective, you can imagine that we are interested in these different theories and exploring how they affect what we're doing in the practical level. What kind of programs can we extract from there? What kind of systems can we, how, how that, does each, each theory present different advantages and disadvantages? So it would be nice to be able to swap between them. Uh, so in order to do this, we're using uh, whole light as a theorem prover and we want to encode the logics in there. Um, obviously, uh, obviously all, all the, th the things that I'm going to show you are in whole line and I'm even show you some whole light code just to see that it's actually something that has been implemented properly. Uh, but the general idea is that these are principles that could be a, uh, adapted to any, any theorem, any similar theorem prover like Isabel, for example, or Koch even. Uh, so, uh, and, and of course I could go into the details of classical linear logic and session types, but a lot of people are not familiar with those. So, uh, I'm going to go back into the Curry Howard stuff and a simple propositional logic just to give you the example of how these things work. Uh, so we have a very simple logic with just conjunction and implication, and I'm giving you the ASCII representation for whole light here, just so that we can follow the formulas uh, or the commands in whole light. Unfortunately, whole light doesn't have Unicode, so we have to use ASCII tricks here. But uh, we have a very simple definition of the uh, propositions here uh, with the two connectives, and we have some syntax sugar over here. Nothing too uh, weird. Uh, and then we have the inference rules, which you would find in any kind of uh, textbook for propositional logic. But the thing to notice here is that they are not the, not the usual natural deduction rules. Instead, we're using sequent calculus uh, just because it's much easier to deal with at a structural level uh, and to mechanize the, the proofs. Um, so the idea is now we want to encode these rules into the logic. Uh, and we do this by a simple inductive definition of the, the consequence operator here. So we use this consequence operator in, in, uh, in whole light because the, we use the equal sign instead of the dash because the other turnstile is already used by whole light. Uh, and by the way, the higher order logic now becomes the meta logic essentially. So all of these operators will be in the meta logic. Uh, and then we use multisets, which helps us uh, get rid of the exchange rule. So we don't have to use this rule to swap uh, the formulae in the sequence or in the context around. And this can be done implicitly uh, as you would do in a paper proof. Oh, no, it's often do in, in a paper proof. Uh, and you've got the whole light syntax here for the empty multiset for multiset uh, union or sum and the singleton multiset. Um, and here's the, an example for one rule, the right conjunction rule, which basically splits uh, this statement into two uh, sub goals. And it's, it's straightforward to encode it. So uh, again, this universal simplification, the conjunction and the implication here are from the meta logic, from higher order logic. And then you notice that the context here is the multiset instead of gamma comma delta. Uh, and so it's, it's a fairly st straightforward uh, representation of this kind of rule. Uh, and here's the whole light syntax, which pretty matches almost directly this uh, uh, formula up there. I'm just showing it for the implementation side. Um, so this is this was just one of the rules. We got all nine of them uh, encoded in this way, and we put them in an inductive definition. This is pretty standard, essentially defining what it means to what consequence means. And we don't go too much deeper into this uh, into the semantics of this. This is all we we need because we we rely a lot on the syntax of things, at least for our application. So now that we have the rules, we'd like to uh, do some proofs. Uh, and here's a very simple proof for commutativity of conjunction, a uh, very simple, straightforward proof on paper. But let's see what happens when you try to mechanize it. Uh, I'm sure some of you may have encountered these issues before. Uh, so starting from the very last rule, like bottom up following the proof, uh, the right implication rule, uh, the actual goal, of course, has an empty context here, which is implicit in the paper proof. Um, and the idea now is that we want to match this uh, bottom part of the rule because we want to apply it backwards. Uh, with this goal. And we're lucky enough that in this case, it matches direct matching uh, is, uh, works uh, perfectly. So we get this instantiation where gamma is the empty multiset, the context here. And this is the new result that we get. And you notice that if you strictly just follow the rule and you don't do anything else, 
uh, structurally, then you get to carry around this empty model set, which is the gamma over here. The next rule is the contraction rule. Nothing too exciting happening here, but it's worth noting that this, the context in this rule is slightly more complicated, but it just so happens that it fits uh, exactly with this goal because we carried around this uh, empty uh, multi set. So this matches exactly. Uh, and this is the new goal that we get. And I think you, you're seeing what we are, where I'm going at, where I'm getting at. Uh, the right con conjunction rule now gets stuck because this is the, uh, the term that we're going to try to match. And this time, the context doesn't match directly because of uh, it, it, the multiset union is right associative. So if you just try to match it directly, gamma will become the empty multiset here, and the rest of the context will go with delta, which is not what we want. We really want to be splitting these two into the two branches of the proof uh, over here. Uh, so if we just follow direct matching, this is not really what we want. This is not really a solvable goal. Um, now, if we want to deal with this structurally, we have to get rid of this empty multi set so that this union matches this union exactly. And the way to do this is by rewriting with uh, the multi set um, lemma that's, that can get rid of this uh, empty one over here. Uh, so we need to do some structural meta level reasoning to be able to deal uh, with these kind of structural issues. And, and you can tell from this is like the breakdown of the whole uh, vanilla Holite proof script that you would have to use to prove this particular lemma. Uh, and match and PTAC is this uh, rule application that with direct matching. So this is, this, this is what really the core of the proof. But then we have all of these rewriting and breaking down uh, sub goals and then uh, reintroducing empty multi sets and so on just so that we can deal with the structural differences and, and, and uh, specific, specific problems that come up. Uh, and again, this is a very, very simple proof. You can imagine that in a more complex proof, you need to be swapping things around, rearranging multi-sets, and, and taking a lot of time to, to deal with these problems. Using our library, uh, we get rid of all of this meta-level uh, meta kind of structural reasoning. Uh, we just have a direct uh, application of each of the uh, rules in the proof. This is the whole like, proof script precisely for this proof. Uh, and if we break it down, you see there are no hanging multi sets anywhere. Everything gets properly cleaned up. Uh, and now the proof script follows the paper proof uh, exactly if you go uh, bottom up. Uh, so things are simplified a lot. Now, the next step is to try and talk about computational translation, like I promised for Kari Howard. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. We introduce a simple lambda calculus variables, products, uh, lambdas, and application. Uh, People ask a lot here about what happens with binding and how we deal with it. The answer is we don't deal with it because we, at this level, and for our application, we only care about syntax and we deal with the binders at the programming level when we translate this to code. Uh, but of course, like I said, these are just uh, principles that you could adopt in another theorem prover because Holite doesn't really have many good ways of dealing with uh, binders. But if you have uh, De Bruyne indices or higher order abstract syntax or anything you want to encode your uh, your calculus here, you can use that instead. And we also define accessor functions for the products, the first and the second part of the product. Uh, so now these are the same rules that I showed you before, but these are now annotated with uh, lambda calculus terms, pretty standard type theoretic stuff, uh, nothing too uh, new going on here. Uh, and the encoding, again, I don't want to go into details, but this is exactly the same process. We have an inductive definition with each of the rules encoded in the same way. The two things to point out here is that we're using a different turnstile symbol here. And we just do this before because we are able to encode both logics at the same time and play around with them with the same set of tactics in the same framework without having to configure anything else, uh, which is quite nice. And we use this double colon symbol to, for, the, for the annotations. So now that we have the rules encoded, we want to be doing two kinds of proofs, or we're able to be doing two kinds of proofs one is a type checking proof where you already specify what the computational component of this type is. Uh, and essentially, if you're able to prove this statement, you're type checking that this type is, that this uh, function here has this type precisely. But the other interesting part, of course, is to do constructive and constructive proof where you specify the type and you don't really know what the component is and you want to find, a, find out through the proof. So going back to the simple proof that we did before on paper, uh, it's, it's quite straightforward to extend it with the annotations from the Curry Howard uh, correspondence. And you notice that this uh, 
particular function does type check based on this proof. Uh, and of course, this is a very simple uh, function that just takes a, a, a variable x that's expected to be a, a product and just swaps the arguments around second and then first. Uh, and the thing to notice here is that if you just remove the red parts, these two proofs are, as far as the logic is concerned, are identical. There's nothing changing. So if these two proofs aren't changing, we would expect that the proof script shouldn't change either. And, and that's what actually happens. So this is the proof script I showed you before for the propositional proof. And we just extend it for the, uh, for the, new, lab, for the new kind of logic with the curry howard annotations. And the only thing that changes between the proof scripts is, this, is the selection of the rules. These now correspond to the new rules in the new theory and the new uh, encoding that we did. But otherwise, we are still using the same tactics. We're still using the same approach. And the, and the uh, proof still matches the paper proof here. Uh, so let's go through the components of what can make this happen and make this possible so that it's quite flexible. So we can use the same tactics, whether we're using uh, uh, dependent of what kind of logic we've introduced or whether there are, it has computational annotations or not. Uh, the first one is multiset matching. So we are trying to accomplish commutative and associative matching uh, by breaking down the multisets into uh, subsets that are either variables or singleton subsets. Uh, and then we, we try to match the constant first. So constants, uh, uh, constant singleton multisets happen when the user wants to instantiate part of the rule in advance. So it matches something very specific in the goal. Uh, so that's also possible. Uh, then we have, um, we match the non-variable, so singleton multisets that have some formula in them that should match, uh, again, to something specific in the goal. And then we end up with the variables, which I'll explain how we deal with uh, in the next slide. Uh, and of course, the challenge here is to verify all this because we, I mean, we use multiset normalization to make sure that after the matching, the two uh, multisets of the rule and the goal match. Uh, and this sounds fairly straightforward at this level, but if you consider that we're using meta variables, which I'm going to talk about next, uh, the two multisets may be changing dynamically through the proof. So you need to be able to always uh, validate them properly. Um, and here's a quick example of how this works for uh, the variable multisets. So if we have this kind of rule and we try to match it to different goals, First, we would try uh, this term because that's the singleton uh, part. Uh, and then we try to match the variable over here. So this one, this one matches x times y in this example. So we get this kind of uh, instantiation over here. Very straightforward. Now, gamma doesn't have anything to match to, so we just give it the empty multi set. Uh, if there is a leftover piece, then gamma will match this singleton over here. And if there are multiple leftover pieces, not necessarily in the right order, we just rearrange them and combine them together to give them to the to gamma. And again, multi-set normalization solves any uh, correctness issue here. Very, uh, rather straightforward things. Uh, but again, careful manipulation, so you don't make any mistakes. Now, construction is quite interesting. Uh, and the way we deal with it is using meta variables. Uh, the idea of the meta variable is that you can instantiate it as you go through the proof dynamically. Um, and this is just showing the proof script. We use this meta exist stack in whole light to introduce, to get rid of the existential quantifier and introduce f as a meta uh, variable in the proof. Um, so uh, this is how this works. Now going back to the application of the rules, bottom up, starting with the right implication again. Now we have this f. It's exactly the same as before, but we have this f lying around here. Uh, and now this has to match the the, our rule, uh, again, uh, applying it backwards. Uh, so the logical part is exactly the same as before and yields this kind of uh, um, substitution or match over here. Now the problem is now we need to match f to this, but it's no longer matching because, uh, because we want f to be instantiated by something that we found in the rule. Whereas up till now, we wanted the variables in the rule to be instantiated with something in the goal. Uh, so when, it comes, when we come across meta variables, we use unification instead. Um, so that we are able to produce this part of the, uh, of the match, of the substitution to make these two match. Um, and you notice that in the new goal, we introduce these new parts, x and y, which came out of the rule. Uh, so we have, we're introducing these new parts that were not in the original goal. Uh, so these new parts are also introduced as meta variables because we're expecting them to get instantiated further down the proof. Uh, so I'm skipping the contraction step because it's very, very straightforward. Nothing special happening there. But we do end up with this uh, new uh, sub goal, 
And now we want to apply the right conjunction. We still have this y and x lying around, which were which came from the previous application of the rule. Uh, so now if we want to apply this one, we have to make sure that all the variables are fresh because you never know which of these variables will end up in the proof in your goal. Uh, and if and here we have x and y, for example, and we don't want them to clash with this x and y. So keeping all the variables fresh is important. And following the same process, because this is a meta variable, we are able to unify it with this uh, term over here. So this is the part we introduce. And these are the new, the two new sub goals occurring from these part of the rule. Uh, one has x prime and the other one has y prime. Also meta variables because they came up in this rule. Uh, so to sum it up so far, uh, we got these two parts uh, of the, uh, from the unification, from trying to working with the meta variables. So if you put these two together so far, we've instantiated f to be this lambda x, x prime, y prime, from a y prime. Uh, so you see how we are gradually constructing this term as the proof is progressing. And of course, if you complete the proof, this x prime and y prime will continue to be constructed based on the rules that you're applying. And we end up with this expression. You have to believe me on this, but I can show you the proof script as well. But we end up with this expression, uh, which is what we expected uh, to get in the first place, but it's constructed through the proof. So we don't really do anything manually. It, it spits it out at the end. Uh, uh, that's the same way you would find things in Koch. But the difference is that in Koch, for example, uh, you can only get a specific uh, type of language out. You can only get Haskell code out, for example, or uh, a, functional, uh, a functional program out. Whereas in our case, we want to be able to change the theory. We want to be able to use proofs as processes or session types uh, or different theories. And so th this has to be, you have to be able to change the, the, what, what kind of uh, term you're constructing. And that is an important motivator for this kind of work. Even though I'm presenting Kari Howard here, this is just the example. Uh, so I mentioned how we need to be able to keep things fresh, so all variables fresh in the, in, the, uh, in the rules that we use. And we also need to keep track of all these meta variables. Uh, and whenever we try to match something in a goal, we need to know that y and x are meta variables, so that we know where we can apply unification. Uh, so the problem is that the, at least the whole light goal state did not allow this to happen because it's a very, very specific goal, goal state. So it has, uh, again, one of the reasons we chose whole light is because you can actually dig straight to the core and look at these things. That's very nice. So the, at the core, uh, the goal state in whole light has a list of meta variables and the instantiation that ha that's happening so far, which is great. Then we have a list of goals, uh, which are our open sub goals. And then we have a justification, which is basically the LCF approach where it's, this is a function that says, if you give me uh, proofs for all these sub goals, I'll give you the proof of the original sub goal that we started with. And the problem is that when you implement tactics in whole light, and I think it's the same in other theorem proofs as well, uh, the type of the tactic is something that takes a goal and returns a, go a new goal state. So this tactic does not get access to what the meta variables are. Uh, and also there's no way to keep variables fresh unless you use some very, uh, some random numbers or something like that. Um, and, and these are the various commands that are introduced in whole light. So you have E to apply new tactics. So you have prove to prove entire lemmas in one go and the different tacticals to connect the tactics together in sequence and so on. Now, now the first step to build this library was back in 2010. One can hardly imagine how long, how fast the time has flown since then. Uh, but we introduced uh, these tactics that emulate the procedural tactics from Isabel and allow you to apply custom rules in an easy way, which original whole light doesn't let you do that. Uh, this library is actually now part of whole light, so it's uh, part of, of that. This is just to make tactic application easier or rule application rather easier. Um, and what we did for this work is extend the tactic system uh, with this arbitrary uh, extension. Uh, this looks a lot like the state monad kind of thing. And quite interestingly, a couple of years ago, there was a paper in, uh, about Isabel some people doing exactly the same thing to try and automate some proofs and carry information around. So now this tactic, apart from the goal, also takes the state information, if you like to call it that, uh, uh, into account and produces a new goal state and a new state or context or whatever you would like to call that extra bit. Uh, and for this particular work, the extra bit here consists of an integer that allows us to keep all variables fresh. So we increase it every time we instantiate a rule so that we make sure that all the variables are fresh. And the term list is the list of meta variables available to the proof. And all of these functions that I showed and, and, and tactics that I showed here are extended 
to be able to deal with this uh, augmented or extended kind of tactic system. So we really wrote a theorem prover within the theorem prover. Um, and now to finish off, I'm just going to show you the different ways that you can use this kind of framework to, to do proofs. I already show you the interactive way where you just set a goal interactively and start applying different goals to see how it works out. And hopefully you get your proof at the end. Uh, a more typical way that you use in, in whole light and in whole theorem provers is to package the whole proof into one proof statement where you state the, the lemma and you connect all of the tactics together with these tacticals that I talked about, so in sequence in this case, uh, and then dealing with the different branches and so on. Uh, and this is how you would typically package a theorem together in whole light, so you get you, you, you can use it in other things. Uh, and you can even introduce new rules here if you want to have derived inference rules and so on. Um, and another uh, way, which is for me is very interesting to use, and I use it all the time, is this is to when you deal with constructive proofs, where ideally you want to specify the lemma like this, so you don't specify what the com the, uh, the computational part is. Uh, but you execute the proof and you give it the proof script that you would discover interactively and, and that solves this kind of proof. And what this does is it proves the statement. And then if you just use the normal proof statement, you would get you would just get this. You would just get this as a theorem. But with existential there, you can't really use that. You want the theorem with the witness in it. So that's what this command does. It proves this with the proof script and then gives you the theorem with the witness in it so that you can use it in other places as well. And what's very nice about this is that the proof script, so what you see here, is independent of your theory, of the correspondence that you've introduced. Uh, and just to give you a very simple example, if I went here and changed the syntax, for example, I said lambda instead of lam for my lambda uh, syntax here. Uh, if, if I did this and, and I hadn't done this trick, I would have to go here and change the witness manually in all of my proofs uh, to make sure that it matches whatever change I made in my theory. Whereas now, I don't care about the correspondence. This proof will work no matter what I change in the correspondence here, which is very nice. Uh, the next part is programmatically. I don't want to go into too much detail, but the idea is that you can use these tactics to create proof automations. I get uh, a lot of question, uh, often the question about how do you deal with, why don't, do you do backtracking and how do you deal with multiple context splits? And I say, we don't do backtracking because uh, this kind of framework is at a lower level. Backtracking implies that you have another tactic that you want to apply later on and you want to see which particular context fits. Uh, but it is possible if you use these tactics programmatically like I'm doing here, it is possible this, is, this function does exactly that. It iterates over all the subsets uh, until it finds the right one where this tactic, which is an argument here, can be applied. Um, there's also a paper, a recent paper in Lobster, which talks about process composition, which I uh, hinted at first. And there's a lot of automation, proof automation there and it has all been possible thanks to this framework that I presented today. Uh, and just to quickly mention also a visual way of uh, uh, accessing this kind of proof level because we have a, usual, a visual interface that uh, connects into whole light and triggers the proof and then brings the, the results back in, in the visual way so that people don't need to know how to do theorem proving to use our system. And, and last but not least, I just wanted to uh, show that we've implemented other logics and and, and this is part of uh, the, uh, one of the classical linear logic loops rules in proofs as processes. And this is the pi calculus correspondence. And this is what it looks like in our implementation. And we have exactly the same uh, with uh, propositions and sessions. This is the Wadler's, from Wadler's paper and using the CP session calculus. So it's a different translation, but we also have an encoding here. Uh, and if I change the turnstile here, we can have both of them at the same time and do the same proofs and reuse all the proof automation that we've built uh, for one of them uh, can be uh, directly reused for the other one as well. Um, so that was uh, all I had to say. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you. Um, so we have about one minute left for questions. <laughs> if in case anybody has one. Uh, apparently not. So in that case, can you maybe uh, basically you are, oh, I see there is something in the questions. Uh, I think Alberto has a question apparently. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a naive question because I don't have visibility of, uh, of the whole project, but in the 
In the 90s, uh, Frank Fanning presented a way of encoding uh, sequence calculus, even linear logic uh, sequence calculi, without uh, encoding multisets. So just using what's called a structural approach. So you just have uh, two judgments, one for hypothesis, one for conclusion, and then they implemented the whole thing in, in 12. And the beauty of it, it just didn't have to do any multiset manipulation. So I was just wondering uh, if you look at this kind of approach and, uh, and essentially why not using directly logic programming language rather than, uh, than a theorem proving if you're not doing meta theory. Thanks. Uh, that's a good question. I, I'm not uh, off the top of my head. I'm not familiar with exactly the, the work that you're presenting, but it sounds straightforward. I mean, it, I, I sort of can follow what they did. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I can compare it directly. May, I mean, it's just a different way of approaching things. And 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 just because we are not doing any meta level theory, that doesn't mean that another using a different encoding you wouldn't be able to do a meta level theory pro uh, proving. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not. I, I mean, I'm not sure how well. Uh, the other approach would work. But for us, this is very flexible. Uh, and again, the multi-set manipulation was a bit of a pain, but once we got this library going, I've never thought about it ever again. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think I have a satisfactory answer because exactly because I don't know the, the work that you're talking about and how, how, how it actually deals with all the contexts and, and splitting and carrying it through. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, like I said, it was a bit of work to get this going and making sure that it validates properly, but we get a fully verified proof in the end. Uh, before we get a, all the guarantees for the, the constructed part and uh, it's working quite well. Okay, thank you again.